Um, my name is Benjamin, Benjamin Kabe. I am a developer advocate at the uh, Linux Foundation for the Zephyr project. And uh, today, we're going to talk about um, SBOM software, Bill of Materials, um, how, what it is, how you can use them with Zephyr. Um, being a developer advocate, I guess, I'm by no means a lawyer, by no means a, an expert on the topic of like software supply chain management, uh, but that's most kind of the point of the presentation. Um, we hear a lot these days about uh, like software, like so tra tracking software provenance and those kind of things. This is becoming increasingly important, especially in the context of embedded uh, devices. And um, I wanted to learn more, quite frankly, about the topic, uh, figure out what sort of the landscape of uh, the tools that are available out there to help um, with that, basically. Um, and by, by that, I mean, uh, what is an SBOM in the first place why, and why you should care, what makes it even more important uh, to have uh, a sense of like what is your bill of material software-wise when it comes to embedded, uh, what are some of the tools, standards out there as PDX is one that you may have heard of, uh, what, does it mean for, what does it mean for Zephyr, like are there things available that can help sort of capture uh, the, again, the SBOM, and we will uh, see, see what, what an SBOM is um, in the first place. What are some of the tools, and hopefully sometimes for Q&A as well. I mean, some of you, many of you, most of you, I don't know, um, you are embedded developers, one way or the other, a bomb you're familiar with, uh, sort of like tracking and capturing the, the list of all the things physically, that physically end up uh, making up your, um, your PCB and your actual device. That's great, and I mean, you, you need that. Uh, you, and you, I mean, actually some uh, regulation authorities might actually be interested in that. Kind of similarly, um, frankly, you want that for your software as well. This sort of like nutrition facts kind of label and list of what are all the things that I'm pooling when I'm running West Build uh, for my Zephyr application, what ends up being shipped, being put in the ceilings of whatever uh, buildings where I'm deploying um, remote uh, and like wireless thermostats, what is ending up in cars, medical devices and whatnot, like it's important uh, for many reasons we will, uh, which we will dive into, but they all point down to understanding basically what is, what are you, what, what is the kind of software that you're sourcing and shipping into your, um, into your actual products and basically managing your supply chain for the software as well. There's many reasons why you need to basically extend the, um, and, and to look into what, uh, what kind of software you're, um, you're shipping. It kind of starts with, frankly, um, for legal reasons and licensing reasons, like there, you might not be able to use uh, necessarily all the kind of um, uh, software that, that, that you wish. Like there might be some, some um, open source software, uh, open source projects out there that you would love to use, but they are basically just incompatible with either open, other open source software that you're already using or just incompatible with uh, your um, product strategy or your, uh, your company's policy. So basically helping you understand what it is that you're pooling when you're sourcing open source component A, what are all, all of the other dependencies that are not necessarily super visible at first, uh, so that you can realize that, oh yeah, I thought A was okay, but there is this, um, this dependency that will actually be problematic. Uh, or also decision making wise, um, having more visibility into your sort of dependency graph will also help you maybe design your software better because you will sort of think twice when it comes to just like uh, very um, um, conveniently taking this random or project, uh, project off of GitHub and figuring out that at the end of the day, although the license was kind of okay, it kind of pulled many other dependencies that might sort of um, uh, bite you uh, later on. So getting more visibility, more insights uh, into the, the kind of uh, um, things that you will be sourcing and eventually putting in your uh, final image uh, is, is quite important. Um, frankly, there's also reasons that are basically just you're shipping a product and the FCC or the Cyber uh, Resiliency Act in Europe and whatever new uh, regulations might, might come, uh, existing or new uh, regulations, actually ask you, uh, al although it might not be like required that you make that available publicly to your end customers, 
they might ask you that you actually keep track somewhere in your technical documentation of a high level list of what is the what are the components what are the suppliers uh, of, of the, co the software components that you ended up putting into your um, uh, your product of course uh, one other important aspect is you want to know what software you're, you're using also to be to get better visibility in terms of am i impacted by a security vulnerability i mean i kind of know that i've been using embed tls say for my um, for my like securing my, my networking stack there's apparently a vulnerability in version xyz what's the version i was using again in this in, in this product i shipped uh, 18 months ago hopefully i mean it might be depending on how uh, you've been sort of what are your internal processes it might not might not be that easy to get that information uh, uh, quickly so that you can really react and potentially patch your devices, et cetera, if you're impacted. If you're not, you also want to know that because you don't want to patch and, and roll out um, like painful, risky uh, software updates uh, in the field if you weren't uh, impacted in the first place. Um, and this kind of also uh, boils down to having and using, hopefully, not only like thinking about um, materializing this software bill of material, but uh, also doing so using existing tools and standards so that you can really streamline the process and it's not only it doesn't become an afterthought but it's really something that just like taps right into your um, development best practices taps into uh, like or hopefully using standards uh, also taps into um, other tools that the software uh, regulation authorities and uh, the, the government regulation authorities and whatnot um, might require you to produce like when um, when you're expected to give an S-bomb to, again, say FCC or the, um, the European Commission, they will ask for uh, um, a given set of information. You'd rather use um, standard tools for that. S-bombs, so it's not necessarily a new thing, obviously, um, but interestingly, when it comes to embedded, there are things that make it even more important slash tricky to, uh, to address, um, like in embedded, I mean, and I guess, uh, in many other places, but in embedded, there's often like a, a really good uh, mix of open source and proprietary software. Uh, that tr so tracking um, and sort of identifying what what is what uh, can be uh, quite uh, quite important. The way to build embedded software, there's actually many ways to do so, and uh, there might be different pieces of your uh, application that are built in different ways. So all those different pieces and 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 compilers and tool chains and whatnot, like. Are they able to give you the information, the metadata you need to really capture uh, like all the all the things that uh, you, you you would hope to get into your S bomb? There's all the constraints around longevity, like uh, embedded products, connected products, IoT products. They get deployed and run for for a long time, which means that that this particular S bomb that captures which version of embed TLS you were using and which tools, uh, which compilers you were using to build your, uh, your solution. It's really, really important to get accurate uh, information um, and across the entire supply chain, which is, if we think Zephyr, but really any embedded project, really, there's lots of pieces, lots of software components that you're pulling, right? Like, there's probably HALs from your silicon vendors, there's the author's bits, there's third-party modules, like I mentioned embed TLS, could be TensorFlow Lite, I mean, you name it. Um, there's your own code, right? And it might be under, released under whatever license. It might be, um, uh, yeah, whatever, really. But um, it, yeah, it can be complex. So there's a need uh, to, um, I mean, and there are standards, hopefully, out there to uh, sort of standardize what should go into an SBOM, what sort of like the, the minimal required uh, set of things and again metadata that you need to capture to uh, identify the provenance of your software, the all, all things licensing, security information, like things that identify the, the software components in a, in a good enough fashion so that you know whether such or such module when there is a CVE uh, reported, is this the actual module that, that you're shipping or a version that is uh, impacted by a set vulnerability. So yeah, SPDX is effectively an, an ISO standard. Uh, if you've 
if you're familiar with the topic, uh, at least remotely, you may have seen that there is a, a brand new version of SPDX that was released um, over the weekend, I think. Uh, and we will be briefly touching uh, upon that. What is SPDX? How does it look like? Um, it's so SDPX, SPDX, it should really say up there. Uh, so we'll see, you will see the typo for the next couple of slides, I guess. Um, so it's. Um, you may have heard the, the term, uh, fr frankly, just because you're a contributor to open source and there's always those, those headers, uh, copyright headers or license headers uh, that m mention uh, the standard. There's more things that go into the standard uh, in the form of basically standardizing the uh, manifest for, say, if I were to build this uh, open source or whatever, really, this application uh, made of uh, really only uh, a simple source file a make file that provides probably some kind of instructions to, to build the system, and then a binary um, with SPDX and without like, we, we won't read everything line by line, but uh, um, sp splitting all the, the, the entire content of like the manifest for the hello package slash uh, application that eventually might go into, into an actual product um, would look something along those lines, like you would have uh, a, a set of like keys and values uh, that, that go uh, into the file, identifying who created uh, the package in the first place, who created uh, the manifest. Also, it might be you might you might have been relying on a third-party tool to help you with providing some of the information in there. Um, what is um, where can one find like where sort of the, the origin of the of the software. Um, of this particular software package. In this case, it looks like it comes from GitHub. What is the, the SHA of the commit corresponding to the, the, the version of the application slash package? What's the license uh, that is um, provided by the provider of the package, uh, either uh, through uh, like documentation or either through, uh, it might be something that the tool has automatically guessed Best based on other information. So this is something that can be materialized in, in the SPDX file. What is the, uh, the actual binary corresponding to the application? Again, it probably has some kind of um, um, hash uh, and, and signature that can, be, can prove useful to, 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 um, uh, to, to, to check later that the, the package hasn't been tampered with. What are the source files? What is the, um, the license, the copyright information of the source file? I think you get the idea, right? Uh, capturing also the relationship between all those um, elements. The source file gets um, uh, touched and gets ma manipulated uh, uh, through the make file so that it ev eventually generates a binary. I mean, those kind, all those kind of dependencies, again, you get the idea. This is how you're eventually going to capture the kind of information that will be useful to know, oh yeah, like someone just told me that uh, the, this source file in embed TLS in version XYZ is problematic. Is it part of my build? Is it part of my package? You can, uh, you can get that kind of information. How do you build the SPDX file? There, there's tools out there and uh, it can be, some of it may be uh, done manually. I don't think uh, that makes sense when it's like uh, when, when we're talking like hundreds of compilation units and tons of like license information, etc. So obviously, there's tools that help automating that. In the context of Zephyr, actually, um, there is a support for SPDX, not SPDX three uh, just yet. So uh, we're looking and uh, talking about SPDX two point three at the moment. But the way it works. Uh, is pretty simple as an end user uh, or a consumer of the, uh, this functionality. You just ask West, uh, the, the West meta tool, uh, to generate an SPDX for you. And so it's kind of like a three-stage um, uh, three process. First, when initializing your, prior to building, uh, you sort of want to give a hint to, um, to West and to CMake uh, under the hood that you want to instrument your build it, so the reason it's opt-in is basically because it might slow down your, uh, your build just a little bit. It's basically going to use um, a CMake API. Like we are telling CMake uh, ahead of time, I want you to give me lots of like, information with regards to what are all the compilation units uh, that are, that are going to be pulled into my build, uh, what are their dependencies, their, um, uh, whether they come from Git or something else. I mean, there's, there's quite a nice uh, uh, API actually that 
West uh, is going to use uh, or is going to tell CMake to, to, to enable. Then we build um, the project as usual with, again, an extra option that gives even more uh, metadata to, uh, to, to capture even more metadata. I guess, and it's actually, I, I just did said something wrong just before. Like the, for example, identifying whether something comes from Git or not, this wouldn't be CMake that does that. This is actually West. Uh, so enabling the build output meta thingy, this is the kind of thing you need to know what are the modules that your app application might be using. Modules as in Zephyr modules. Uh, Zephyr modules potentially mapping to um, uh, modules in the uh, context of CVEs. Like CVEs are reported against embed TLS, against uh, tiny DTLS, whatever. Uh, and so once we have basically our build, all our artifacts plus all the metadata, then we can just compute uh, and uh, spit out um, an SBOM. Three, actually. Uh, three and soon four. Um, it's the way, I mean, yeah, it's, it's split across, across three files, but uh, essentially this is sort of the, the same information uh, that, that, that you get. In one file, uh, you would get uh, all the, uh, something that's more like related to the actual sources of Zephyr and the one uh, out of the thousands and thousands of files that make up Zephyr, there's probably only a, a handful or maybe a hundred, I don't know, but not only a few that are going to end up uh, linked into your, your final binary. So what are those sources? Uh, what are the file names against, uh, again, the, uh, the MD5 uh, ash, etc. So the, the Zephyr that SPDX file captures that. Um, the app dot, uh, app dot SPDX does all, about the same, but for your actual main and your actual, your own uh, application code. And then um, the build SPDX is more about the, the build artifacts, like the final health image, potentially the dot A's and sort of like the, uh, all the intermediary objects that, that, are, that were built. And again, with all the dependencies allowing you to track uh, how such or such uh, library or such or such final image was uh, obtained. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what, um, that's what you can get uh, for, for free, basically, in Zephyr. And we're going to see, um, sort of in action, what is the information that's captured and how to make sense uh, of it, because, I mean, that's what you want. Uh, there's many things that uh, the SPDX prove uh, useful for. First one, I guess, is uh, if you start caring or being asked about having S-bombs, you better do it in a way that, like, where you're actually capturing as much information as you can. Like, it, it won't help you all that much if the SBOM only tells you the, the list of all the files that were uh, used for, for building your application. Sure, it will be still sort of a valid SBOM, but if it doesn't contain, uh, like, the, the signature of the files, like the creation date, the origin, as in which repo they were pulled from, et cetera, then that's not really useful for security management or for anything really. Um, so you want like tools that hopefully help you do that, sort of assess whether your S bombs are as good as, as it gets. Um, you want you want to use the S bombs, of course, to understand the licenses and what is sort of like uh, your security post or I, I should say I guess uh, legal posture when it comes to. Um, Am I pulling GPL code that I uh, didn't realize I was? Um, things like that. And eventually, or at least uh, um, uh, on top of that, having the ability to find vulnerabilities. Because if you've captured enough information, then um, you can probably know whether uh, when, when a new CV is, is, is open, whether it sort of matches the, the kind of information that's in your um, SBOM. So some of the tools, and that's, that was sort of my long intro into uh, why I wanted to do this talk, I want you to sort of leave the room with some pointers to open source tools that I found uh, pretty useful to make sense out of the SPDX and the SBOMs uh, that you can get out of Zephyr or any other system really. Um, one is the NTIA checker, so that's kind of going in, uh, in order of the three bullet points you were seeing just before. First, looking about uh, sort of completeness, like uh, am I building SBOMs uh, that capture enough uh, and useful information? So there are guidelines from some uh, authorities out there. Um, one is NTIA. I actually 
forgot the, uh, what's behind the, the acronym, but the, um, this tool will tell you for a given um, SPDX file, essentially, whether uh, you are um, doing all you could. So if I were to, and this is where, this will be my call to action at the end of the presentation, um, the tool in Zephyr, like the, the SPDX tooling in Zephyr is not perfect just yet, sometimes because the tool itself is, could, could, could be more uh, complete and more powerful, or sometimes because we just don't have enough metadata, uh, the, meta the metadata we would need doesn't exist in the first place. So it's, uh, it's, kind, of, it's kind of a bit of both, but yes, yeah, say uh, we look at the, the SPDX file for uh, my um, Zephyr application, Apparently, I've done the right thing when it comes to capturing the names, the identifiers of the components, um, uh, but one thing that's missing is having notion of the suppliers. And so I, I guess for something like embed TLS, the supplier would be, I mean, there's probably some uh, standard way to describe that. Uh, it's probably the ARM embed TLS contributors, or like it's probably a, a pointer to the, the website of the, um, of the project. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is apparently information that would be useful to capture. Um, so yeah, th this tool is interesting in that regard. Uh, kind of related, um, uh, the SBOM QS tool, SBOM uh, QS as in SBOM quality score, it allows you to assess the quality of the SBOM and how consumable it is. Um, so it, it goes actually, I think, sl slightly further. Uh, the, the previous tool was really about like guidelines and recommendations from the authorities. Uh, this one is more about like quality in, in general, um, and, and, uh, and we, we see similar information, frankly. Uh, do we have names? Do we have uh, identifiers? Um, but it actually gives you a score, so you, and you get to, to dig um, and to surface better uh, oh, okay, I forgot, uh, I have only 95% like of the supplier information that was provided. What are the 5% that are missing? Like it's able to provide you with that um, information, give you the nice scorecard that some project would uh, probably like and want to actually surface uh, in their readmes and whatnot to demonstrate that they've done the right thing. Um, so yeah, that's another tool. This one is kind of like, uh, Showing it as sort of an anecdote or uh, as an FYI, it's not really going to use the, the SBOM as in the SBOM of your actual application, like everything I just said before. Um, it's a tool from GitHub that uh, shows you the uh, A SBOM, which uh, rather corresponds to what are the dependencies that are um, defined or uh, uh, that can be found in uh, your GitHub repo. So for some, something like Zephyr, there's like lots of uh, things that, lots of Python stuff that we're pulling, for example, as part of the build system uh, or uh, of West, uh, documentation build, whatever. Those are things that you may or may not use, but it's good to know uh, and to have like in just one place um, a list of the provenance, the versions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's something that maybe you want to capture whenever you do a release. Um, and so this information is available as, as well. If you use the, um, the GitHub CLI, you can run uh, the GH SBOM command, uh, but that eventually, um, eventually gives you exactly the same as uh, what you get on the, um, oh, I'm not logged in, uh, it might not work, let's see. Uh, yeah, it depends, yeah, that, so that would be the kind of information that you see here. It might not be complete, it might not be reflecting uh, the, the reality of what uh, eventually ends up uh, in anything really, just like some, uh, some stuff that's part of your uh, uh, infrastructure and it might make sense to, to capture that information. Um, back to the slides. Uh, SBOM2 doc, uh, so that's a Python, a Python tool, Python, Python helper. This one is quite nice because earlier I was sort of breaking down what goes into an, an, an SPDX file all those key values, uh, it was really flat, right? And it wasn't really uh, surfacing uh, or um, showing you any form of structure. Uh, with uh, the SBOM2 uh, doc tool, you can get um, a JSON file, a PDF, a uh, markdown, which is more like uh, the kind of manifest that you would print and give to the authorities uh, as a uh, really like a, a list of what it is that you're pulling in your system. I think I was running it just before um, uh, starting the talk. Um, SBOM2 doc uh, for uh, Zephyr SPDX. So out of the three SBOMs, this is the one that's sort of listing all the sources that made it into my app. 
My app here is uh, I built uh, the Wi-Fi sample uh, for a, an ARM board. So we will see a bunch of ARM stuff, like Zephyr ARM Arch stuff. We will see a bunch of drivers for my particular um, uh, Atmel board. We will see the kernel libraries, blah, 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 the network subsystem. And so for all those um, uh, files, we get uh, the information that's, that's coming from the, 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 the SBOM, the SPDX file. So license, and this is where we can see that some information is actually um, missing and could be uh, or should be surfaced there. Uh, what are some of the, the packages that, I'm, uh, uh, that are part of my um, repo, et cetera, et cetera. So that's SBOM2 doc. Uh, this one is, this is where it gets really interesting. So the demo of this one I will show uh, in, in just a bit, but uh, it's a tool from Intel that, um, that looks more at the third, I think, bullet point in my, uh, uh, in my list before, tracking security vulnerabilities. Once you, once you start capturing the list of files that you're putting into, uh, into your application with their hash, uh, and also potentially the list of modules, which conveniently, I mean, we have a notion of modules in, in the Zephyr ecosystem, right? Um, do I, am I shipping modules that are impacted by your vulnerability? And so that's the tool, uh, and we're gonna see how, um, how it works. I mean, you, you can use it um, with the current version of SPDX tooling in Zephyr. It will give you some uh, level of, of feedback, but we, it starts really getting interesting when you look at some work uh, that the community is doing around improving SPDX tooling um, in Zephyr. Uh, specifically around adding support for something that's called uh, CPEs and their sort of counterpart, which is pearls. So it's uh, coming from um, uh, security uh, uh, authorities and like the, 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 um, like the authorities uh, managing CVs and, so, uh, and whatnot. They have standard ways to describe software packages. Something like ARM Embed TLS, if you look, uh, if you Google for all the recent CVEs around say embed TLS, so those that have been disclosed or, or th those that are still in the embargo for what it's worth, uh, as part of all the metadata, like you will have of course the description, you will have the score, uh, like telling you how bad of, uh, or how um, uh, risky or uh, yeah, how serious of an issue that is. And one of the um, metadata uh, is the, the CPE. That's what uh, sort of uniquely identifies the, the package and the version slash version range of the, uh, the that the vulnerability uh, applies to. So CPEs, uh, the, the syntax is uh, the, the, the first bullet point. There is another um, uh, variant which is called Perls, which is more where uh, it would be pointing to uh, some kind of uh, source control management um, uh, URL. But that's that's essentially the same information. And this PR, which I hope I was hoping uh, would be uh, would have been merged before this talk, but it's it will, I'm pretty sure it will be merged uh, imminently, pr proposes to add support in Zephyr to augment the metadata of Zephyr modules with the kind of information that I was just talking about. So in Zephyr, uh, when, look, when you basically install uh, Zephyr and you do the initial like West update thingy, it pulls all the modules that are defined and described in your, in your manifest. And all those modules themselves, they have manifests that describe how to build them, how to configure them. The proposition is to add metadata that indicates, oh yeah, the embed TLS module that Zephyr has, it's effectively embed TLS version uh, XYZ. I mean, the, the sort of the fork we have in Zephyr is usually like pretty much the upstream uh, equivalent to the upstream um, uh, project. And so capturing that information so that when you then uh, build your SPDX, um, uh, you, you create the SPDX file for your application, there's one more piece of, uh, one additional piece of information that's being surfaced, which is, oh yeah, your application is, um, this is the Wi-Fi sample from Zephyr. Oh, it does, it pulls in TLS, TLS as per the uh, West uh, metadata information is in version 3.5.1 in your shipped binary. Then you can just ask the, this tool, and by the way, I'm showing an open source tool, but I'm, 
I, I know for a fact that there are some commercial tools out there that are way more powerful and way more sexy also to some extent uh, and have way more um, complete databases of vulnerabilities that um, you can use, but granted that you have the uh, captured the CPE, that's what you can do. Uh, and that's like really I was, uh, I'm running that against the, the, the proposed PR. Are there any vulnerabilities in my code? Yep, you're shipping uh, MBRTL 3.5.1. There are uh, three, uh, three vulnerabilities. Some of them seem to actually be reasonably critical. So that's, uh, I think that's where the, this kind of um, promise of S-bombs uh, uh, are meant to, 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 uh, to be the manifest of all the things that end up in your uh, software. That's where it starts really showing its value, right? Uh, and something else that's coming or was just released, like I said, is SPDX 3.0, which uh, the, the main idea is that, I mean, I've been working you through some of the data that goes into an SPDX file. It's as of 2.x, it's, it's pretty flat, it's pretty hard to, um, if I go back a few slides, basically. The, the fact that there's some information missing in there, in the current version of the SPDX file that I'm um, uh, shipping, might not be a problem depending on who you are. Like uh, there's many entities that might be, in, might be interested in the manifest of a particular um, um, binary image or like software. Um, if you're a lawyer, you really don't, you don't care all that much uh, as long as the license information is being captured, that's what you're gonna care about. If you're um, someone who's like, I don't know, a release engineer, who cares about reproducibility of builds, et cetera, maybe the kind of metadata that you wanna make sure is being captured uh, are things like the, um, um, like what is, what is capturing the description of what, are, what were the artifacts used to actually build the system. So um, the, not necessarily the source files, but really more like the make files and the, the um, uh, like descriptions of all the compilers, tool chains and whatnot. So, Long story short, the idea of SPDX 3.0 is to describe uh, a handful of profiles to uh, cater for like the different uh, kind of consumers or producers for what it's worth uh, there might be for, uh, for an S-bomb. Again, if you're a lawyer, uh, if you're interested in all, thing, all things licensing, then you really care about all things licensing. If you're um, uh, more in the, uh, in the um, you're coming more from a background of I want to make sure that uh, what, what we did with AI uh, is, uh, is uh, like we have, we have been using um, models that, have, that are clear uh, IP-wise, et cetera. You might care more about some of the, the, the metadata that's uh, being introduced by uh, SPDX3 around all things AI. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's basically what I had. As always, um, help is very much wanted. Uh, I don't know much about you guys, but this is where we have time for a quick discussion. If some of you are interested in those, um, in this work around uh, SPDX and NS bombs, SPDX 3 was ju just released, um, improving the current tool tooling that we have in Zephyr so that it's compatible with SPDX 3 would certainly be uh, 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 most welcome. There is, as you saw, uh, still some data that we could uh, capture. Uh, that we are not, either because the tooling is not complete just yet, or we would just need to add the metadata to whatever um, files uh, where it's miss missing at the moment. And yeah, as always, the best way to sort of interact with the community would be GitHub, Discord, uh, to ask uh, uh, yeah, any questions you might have or any feedback you might have. But we also have, I think, a few minutes, five minutes for questions. Yes, so, you've got about five minutes. Yeah, um, cool, perfect. First, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? So all of the tools you've been showing today rely on the presence of SPDX tags, right? Pretty much? Uh, yes and no. Um, there's, I mean, SPDX tags, if you, like in the Zephyr source code, there's not that many, frankly, right? It's just the, License information, uh, copyright information. We're not even using the sort of the standard uh, uh, standard stuff. It's the, the licensing information. Like I, like I said uh, uh, in, in the beginning, it's it's only a subset of what of the 
of, of the, the things that you want to uh, do. And the SPDX tags, as you, as you uh, mentioned them, are mostly related to, to, to licensing, but there's also more metadata that just like the kind of things that you want to capture when you, when you build your, uh, your application, like the, the hash of the files or the, um, the Git remote URLs of all the, all the modules, et cetera. You don't need anything special except for the tooling that needs to be built to make sure that you turn um, this information that you were able to compute into and, and dump it into the, the, the SPDX files. Yes, but what, uh, I understand that. But what I mean is, in terms of licenses, of providing a list of licenses that the application uses, one of the tools showed a very nice. Yes. Uh, You're so relying on tags for that, that, that one. Yes. Is that is that rely, relying then on the I don't know if you call it tags, the SPDX line. Yeah, yeah, that, the, that relies on the tags. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, but and this is where I think the commercial tools uh, are adding additional value. Uh, in SPDX, there's this notion of um, the concluded license versus whatever is called the other option, which is you always have a, um, I mean, sometimes you will have tools that make an ed educated guess about the license, right. and you can still sometimes override that, because you know for a fact that uh, another license applies, or I guess it would be the other way around, the, the tag is missing in the file, the concluded license would be none as per the, the tooling, but then you, you, uh, you as a human, you know where this is coming from and you may be able to add this information, but obviously this is way beyond the scope of uh, open source tooling or beyond the scope of what Zephyr provides as infrastructure, right, to, to help people. Right, okay, that's, that's the context I wanted to get. Thank yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, there was one here. There's someone up here first. I think you answered it in the previous question, but the Zephyr build creates the XPDX files that you can then analyze. And it gets the, it creates those files by basically text parsing the tags that are embedded in those libraries that it pulls from. Yes, <clears throat> so when you enable and when you're interested in SPDX uh, output as part of your build artifacts, you first ask CMake basically to give you the list of what are all the files that are actually relevant. And then when, once you have this list of source files, this is where you scan them for license information. And this is where you use the, also the CMake uh, metadata to figure out what, what's the dependency between, oh yeah, this source file ended up being, this .a ended up being part of my ELF file. And so then you have all the pieces that are finally um, together, yeah. So does the Zephyr uh, meta SPDX uh, application, can that be abstracted out away from Zephyr and then used for any project that uses CMake? Uh, yes, there's actually a talk, um, which I, I think is still applicable, uh, the content of the talk. Uh, the person who actually wrote the CMake-based black magic stuff for Zephyr uh, gave a talk at FOSDEM, I think in 2021. So you will find both the slides, the video online, uh, or you can just look at the Zephyr, the code in Zephyr, um, how they used, uh, I had no idea that there, there is a CMake API, right? And so that's, that's basically what it's using uh, under, under the hood, so yeah. Thank you. Uh, hey Benjamin, so yesterday the cat was showing all kinds of SPDX variants, SPDX safety, security, yeah. licensing, and a whole lot of other things. In the, take safety, for example. Uh, I mean, she was showing traceability, testing, and so on. What, what does that mean to us, for example, as a Zephyr project, to actually get to that? Does that mean adding all of this metadata into, into the files, the relevant files? Or is that something that would be? I think it's sim similar to what Carles was, was, was saying at the beginning. If adding some kind of metadata, uh, I mean, there's no, no requirement, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, like the SPDX specification is really just about the, the final manifest. How you obtain it is up to you. If adding some tags helped you achieve that, then that's great. Typically, the tags that, are, that we have in all our headers for license and copyright, that's that makes our lives easier, so we, we, we do that. But uh, if we do, if we have other ways to capture requirements, traceability, and whatever else we need, um, 
there's no, I don't think there is any sort of standard tags to, to do that. It might be, we might have our own YAML files, uh, which we will run through some generators to speed out uh, the, the, the SPDX file. Does that make sense? No, what I'm trying to get to, I mean, the, right now we have the license tag, which is basically the, the minimum that probably SPDX can, can consume in terms of like, you know, uh, metadata. A lot of things are automatically generated and figured out like hashes and stuff like that. And that's completely fine. What I'm trying to get, to get actually to something intelligent like traceability, by the way, the echo here is so bad, yeah? Yeah. Uh, there, there will be a need to add metadata and identify files and, yep. and put like all kinds of things. And, and I'm trying to understand how intrusive that can be the more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I get the question. Yeah. Uh, and my point is that as far as I can tell, there's no tool that expects anything. Uh, I mean, there's no tool that will take whatever tags you're thinking of and will do anything magically. We will have to write ad hoc tools to to, to, to generate the SPDX files anyways. So it's whatever we think uh, is convenient for us uh, to, to describe the, the information. Like e even like all that I've shown, uh, like it's, it's relying on ad hoc so-called ZSPDX tooling in Zephyr itself. Like the SPDX files, we generate them manually. It's not like we would use a tool to be like, hey, here's the Zephyr sources. We have put all the traceability tags please give us the SPDX. As far as I know, this kind of tool doesn't exist. So it, we can, we'll, we'll talk more. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.